Good evening or good morning, depending on where in the world uh, you are uh, viewing in from. Um, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to uh, host the uh, 60 Minutes um, uh, Symposium on Stone Disease. Uh, we really have world-class experts who are our faculty uh, here today. Um, Dr. Roger Sir is uh, from the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine in San Diego. Uh, Dr. Kenneth Pace from the University of Toronto in Toronto, Canada. And Dr. Thomas Chi from University of, Southern, uh, University of California, San Francisco in San Francisco. Uh, these three are leaders in the field and really uh, have been at the vanguard of progress. Uh, the USC host is Dr. Mike Wynn. Uh, Dr. Wynn is leading the charge uh, in stone disease, along with Dr. Gerhard Fuchs, uh, also at uh, the University of Southern California and USC. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to pass the baton over to my colleague and good friend, Dr. Mike Wynn. Mike? Good evening, and welcome everyone to today's Kidney Stones uh, Surgery Urology 60 Minutes webinar. We are very fortunate to have with us three leading experts in kidney stone treatment to share their thoughts and tips on how to optimize stone treatment outcomes. Just gonna pull up my slides here. Today, Dr. Roger Sir will be talking with us about ureteroscopy. Dr. Kenneth Pace will be discussing ESWL and Dr. Thomas Chi will be covering PCNL. Time permitting, we will also ask our panelists to briefly discuss their approaches for typical stone scenarios uh, encountered in clinical practice. Surgical treatment for kidney stones may appear to be relatively straightforward. However, it actually is currently at a crossroads. Ureteroscopic clearance rates are not as good as we initially thought. Shockwave lithotripsy usage continues to decline, while PCNL technology and indications are constantly expanding. The presentations from our panelists today will help us to better understand what role each of these approaches should play in 2020. Our first speaker today is Dr. Roger Sir. Dr. Sir is from, the UC, from UC San Diego and has been an innovator in kidney stone treatment using both surgical and medical preventive approaches. He is the director of the Stone uh, Center there at UCSD. He also served 20 years as a Naval physician and retired at a rank of Navy captain. And he continues to have a dual appointment at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. He will be reviewing the ureteroscopy for us today. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Thanks, Mike, and uh, thanks, Dr. Gill. I'm really honored to have this opportunity. And so without further ado, I just wanna share four things that you should know for ureteroscopy in 2020. These are my disclosures. So four, uh, four topics that I wanna cover is number one, laser technology. Number two, discuss the term stone free. And what does that really mean? Three, how do we prevent sepsis and ureteroscopy? It's not a trivial complication. It happens more often probably than we like. And lastly, I just wanna to touch on the role of the renal ultrasound that oftentimes is used uh, in the setting of post-operative or pre-operative imaging for ureteroscopy. There's some recent data that I'd like to share with you about it. So as far as our laser technology, I have, full disclosure, I have a little bias towards the Moses machine because I have it. Um, but that being said, um, there are other lasers you, or versions of the homeo laser you can use, but I do want to talk about what I perceive to be the benefits of the Moses laser. And if you don't have the Moses, uh, other options that are available to you. These are the following laser terms that you should be familiar with. We are using the Moses laser monitor to demonstrate the different aspects of lasers. There's the pulse energy, 
which describes the energy emitted from the laser tip fiber expressed in joules. There's the frequency, which is the number of pulses in one second expressed in hertz. And then there's the total power, which is simply the multiplication of the pulse energy and frequency. Here, 0.3 times 80 is 24 watts. The pulse duration is the duration of a single optical pulse expressed in microseconds. Traditional systems are fixed and they cannot be altered. They range from anywhere from 150 to 350 microseconds. The current system, such as used with the MOSES P120 laser, range anywhere from 150 to 1200 microseconds. And then there's the pulse modulation, which is a proprietary and special aspect of this machine that actually involves modulating and changing the shape of the energy. Here we see pulse duration in graphical as well as in video form. The short pulse utilizes a higher peak power resulting in a rounded bubble and the longer Long pulse utilizes a lower peak power with a pear-shaped bubble, leading to less retropulsion. So the shorter pulse duration leads to more retropulsion, while the, long, the benefit of a long pulse is less retropulsion. Similarly, there's, there's greater fiber degradation with the short pulse and less fiber degradation with the long pulse. Ablation and fragmentation is somewhat similar between these two. Unlike a standard homium pulse, where the majority of the energy is lost in a single pulse to the surrounding liquid medium, the MOSES technology uses a proprietary initial laser pulse to create a small cavity, much like the parting of the Red Sea, and through which a second energy pulse is then delivered. This permits two things. Number one, more energy is transferred to the stone and not lost to the surrounding medium. Number two, the laser travels at a farther distance than the standard homium laser. What you see here on the left-hand side is a view of, at a micro level, where the MOSES technology is utilized. You can see minimal retropulsion. In contradistinction, above it is a standard homium laser. You can see the retropulsion that occurs. I actually performed I uh, showed my junior resident the MOSES technology recently and I recorded it. So I wanted to show her the benefits of a MOSES at 0.8 and 8 with the Mo MOSES distance mode on. And then I, in order to show her what it looks like without it, I turned off the MOSES. And very quickly as she was doing the case, she asked me, please turn back the MOSES on. And so it was kind of a very profound difference that she could see, and it was uh, showing her the obvious benefits of using the MOSES technology. This slide summarizes the pros and cons of the short pulse, long pulse, and the MOSES technology. What you see here is that across the board, Utilizing the MOSES technology carries a significant benefit, less retropulsion, less fiber degradation, and improved ablation and fragmentation of the stone. We will show you some more data to support these findings. One may ask, well, why use the pulse modulation of MOSES when you can simply purchase a laser with just a long pulse? Long pulse has the benefits of less retropulsion, However, this data from Duke University shows why MOSES is superior to long pulse. They provide fragmentation of both MOSES contact and MOSES distance in this graph. And two findings should be clear from this graph. Number one, in the blue, this demonstrates where the fiber tip is in contact with the stone. The MOSES contact mode outperformed all other settings when it was in contact with the stone at zero millimeters. It also statistically significantly outperformed the long pulse at zero millimeters. The second conclusion of this slide 
right, is that when lo looking at the orange bars, this represents when the fiber was one millimeter away from the stone, that the Moses distance outperformed all other settings. In fact, it significantly outperformed the long pulse at one millimeter. A recent randomized controlled trial demonstrates the clinical superiority of Moses over conventional lasers. Specifically, there was a 10 minute savings with Moses. You may dismiss 10 minutes as trivial. Let's say you have six one hour uteroscopic cases and you use the Moses fiber here saving 10 minutes for each case. If you sum that up, that, that creates a savings of 60 minutes and perhaps you could add on an extra case to that day. Let's talk about the more newer Saltive Superpulse Thulium fiber, which is a very thin, long silica fiber that's essentially doped with thulium ions. Originally, it was created for stones, BPH, and tumors. What's really nice about this is that the box itself, the hardware, is quite small. It's quite compact, as you can see right here on this top part of the stack. It's not much bigger than a shock pulse um, box. And better yet, it doesn't need a, excuse me? It doesn't need a 220 outlet. It only requires a 110 outlet. And I don't have this device yet, uh, but anecdotally from what I've heard, it's quite, uh, it's not very loud compared to the Moses technology or other machines out there that are homium laser. Here's some data that you can compare the Tulium to the homium laser. It has a slightly lower wavelength. Uh, the pulse energy is slightly, uh, it's, it's, it's broader from as low as 0.025 up to six joules. But re what really stands out here is the pulse frequency. The, the uh, Tulium fiber can go up to 2000 Hertz, which is much higher than a 120 a homium laser. And this potentially affords the ability to, to create dusting like fragments. And this is a video that I borrowed from Ben Chu. And what you see here is a very low pulse energy. I'm gonna skip to the, uh, towards the fragmentation of the stone that this tulium fiber can anecdotally truly create dust, unlike the homium laser, at least purportedly. There's been no head-to-head -head trials here, but those who use the tulium, um, from what I've heard, uh, cite that it really is uh, making what we want to achieve in ureteroscopy, which is dust. The second benefit is that because of the low power and extremely low pulse energies you can achieve with it, there's minimal retropulsion. And lastly, and most importantly, is that the safety profile is no different than the homium laser. You might be concerned about high temperatures with 2000 uh, frequency, hertz frequency, but on benchtop testing, there's no difference in uh, intrarenal pressures with the tulium laser. The next topic I want to cover here, um, and I only have a couple minutes here, is uh, stone-free uh, stone free rates and the term clinically insignificant residual fragments. Uh, I think this is a misnomer, and the more recent data supports this. Ralph Clayman has made a comment in the Journal of Urology that we've probably kind of uh, accepted these, stone, these uh, overly optimistic stone free rates of 90% in some of our reports, when really um, this has been an impediment to um, our, our technology in many ways by accepting uh, these rates that are truly not that high. More recently, the EDGE Consortium looked at what is the effect of leaving a residual fragment behind? And what they demonstrated in both even small fragments, like less than four millimeters, there's an 18% re-intervention rate. That is to say, you leave a small fragment behind, there's a 20% chance your patient's gonna have to go back for another procedure. And more importantly, if you leave a larger fragment behind, there's a one third or almost a half, per, a 50% chance of the patient requiring another procedure. Most recently here at our AUA 2020 on a virtual presentation, the UT Southwestern group presented that every fragment matters after uteroscopy. They claimed on the Twitter here, if you fragment or extract, you got to get it all. And if you're a duster, you're not a fragmenter, then it has to be fine enough that you, it, it doesn't show up on a CT. And when you look at their data here, what they showed is on First column is the group that actually was stone free on CT. They painstakingly during their uteroscopy to remove every fragment possible. Six weeks later, they did CT. 65 of their uh, subjects had, or renal units had, no stones whatsoever. 87 of their subjects actually had some residual fragment. Look what happens to their stone event rates in the stone free group, stone -free group only 14%. But in those that left a residual fragment behind, 
almost half of their patients went on to have a stone event, defined as a readmission, ER visit, another procedure. Point being, you can't leave a fragment behind after your uteroscopy. And if you do, your patient needs to know that they're at very high risk for another event. So third topic I wanna to quickly cover is just sepsis after uteroscopy. Those of you that do a lot of uteroscopy realize that it's not a trivial event, particularly with multi-drug resistance. A lot of our patients are at risk for having sepsis. And one of the key things that, uh, when you look back at the literature, is that if the intrarenal pressure exceeds 30 millimeters, you then um, have the phenomenon of pilovenous backflow. Now we can't measure intrarenal pressures, obviously, when we do uteroscopy, but the point being, if you have sustained intrarenal pressures, and there's bacteria in the urine, you're now placing your patient at risk for sepsis. So what do we do about this? Well, this, there was a multi-center trial looking at over 2,000 reteroscopies. What they demonstrated that if they use an axis sheet, they could decrease their sepsis rates by 50%. So the point being, you wanna lower your intrarenal pressures. Another study suggested multiple other things that you can do to decrease your risk of sepsis. One, obviously limit the length of surgery. Number two, consider a staged reteroscopy. Number three, decrease the flow rate, or maybe use a larger access sheet. Now, I do want to say one little caveat about turning down your flow rate, especially with these high power machines. This is from the uh, AUA 2020. I tweeted out some data from the Duke University. What they showed was that in as little as one second, if you turn off the flow rate completely at a high power setting of 16 watts, they achieved intrarenal pressures or temperatures of 212 degrees Fahrenheit in in vitro studies. So the point being is you don't want to use too much irrigation to put your patient at risk for sepsis, but you don't want to completely turn off, particularly in a high power setting because you risk thermal injury to the patient. Lastly, for those of us that use ultrasound after ureteroscopy or preoperatively use ultrasound, how useful is ultrasound? I'm actually uh, I'm not a big fan of ultrasound. I actually recommend after any renal, not ureter, but any renal surgery, I recommend doing a low dose CT scan. It's essentially the same uh, radiate ionizing exposure as a KUB essentially and properly done. So and this is why I don't like renal ultrasound for post-operative imaging. This is a study by my new chairman, Dr. Manga, who uh, reported the largest series of uh, looking at the sensitivity and specificity of ultrasound. They looked at 550 patients who had both a CT and ultrasound, and they concluded that ultrasound was insensitive 54% of the time. Now, when they saw stone, it was reliable. It was highly specific at 91%. But a half, half of the time, they couldn't even see the stone. If they saw it on CT, they did not see it on ultrasound. Point being, ultrasound is not terribly reliable. Furthermore, um, this is really alarming, that ultrasound for a small stone, zero to 10 millimeters, was very, uh, tended to overestimate the size of a stone. So let's say you, you take a patient back for a five millimeter stone, do your ureteroscopy, leave a one millimeter fragment behind on CT. If you use an ultrasound postoperatively, there's a good chance that that uh, on ultrasound, that stone may look like a six millimeter stone because it tends to overestimate the size. And your patient will then ask you, why did you leave a six millimeter stone to me, doctor, when you said you removed your five, my five millimeter stone? And worse yet, if you ultrasound tends to underestimate larger stones, this could be problematic if you use preoperatively an ultrasound. Let's say you have a 15 millimeter stone on a CT. You go to a surgery for a ureteroscopy thinking, oh, it's only a 10 millimeter stone, you get up there and lo and behold, it's actually a 15 millimeter stone because you use ultrasound and it underestimated the true stone size. So I'm gonna skip on here, but anyway, so their conclusion was one fifth of their stone patients, if you use uh, ultrasound, will be incorrectly counseled using ultrasound. So my take home message for all these things is number one, if you have uh, a Moses machine, I like the Moses distance mode. However, long pulse is equally helpful for reducing retropulsion and ablation. Number two, I think we need to be a lot more critical about the term stone-free. Stone-free really means stone-free. And if you don't leave a patient stone-free, I think the patient needs to know they're at high risk, according to ET Southwestern, 50% chance of having a post operative stone event at some point. How do we decrease sepsis, low flow, decrease your operative time, consider an access sheath, and lastly, for those of us that like to use a renal ultrasound postoperatively or preoperatively for 
uh, for renal stones, not your renal stones, but renal stones, be cautious because the imaging study itself is somewhat uh, inaccurate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sir, for that excellent talk. Um, for our second talk today, our second speaker is Dr. Kenneth Pace. Dr. Pace is from St. Michael's Hospital, where he, he is the head of the Division of Urology, and from the University of Toronto, where he is the Vice Chair of Urology. His seminal research in improving shockwave lithotripsy has influenced how it is performed worldwide, and he has as much experience performing ESWL as any urologist, in my opinion. He will be sharing with us his approach to shockwave lithotripsy and his tips on how to improve stone clearance rates. Thank you, Dr. Page. Great. Well, uh, thank you both Mike and Indy for uh, kindly inviting me and also for making me the lone speaker from outside the great state of uh, California. So uh, bear with me. I'll bring my Canadian perspective to things. These are my disclosures. Uh, I don't think they affect the contents of my talk. And uh, thanks a lot for giving me this topic because, quite frankly, urologists prefer ureteroscopy. This is data from Ontario where we can see in red that ureteroscopy has become our market leader for the treatment of stones and that shockwave lithotripsy has declined in its market penetration for a variety of reasons. What I'm going to do today is take you through some ways we can try and maximize shockwave lithotripsy outcomes. And that will begin, of course, with patient selection. We know that Stone size and stone location are two key parameters for predicting lithotripsy success. This is old data, but it's no different now. We know that larger stones do worse and uh, stones differ whether located in the kidney or the ureter or even where in the kidney they're located. We also have more information that we can glean from CT scans, whether it's the stone density or skin to stone distance. Both of these will predict fragility for shockwave lithotripsy and to some extent shockwave lithotripsy fragmentation and we could put these parameters together to try and predict for our patients how lithotripsy may be expected to work. We also know stone composition, for example, cysteine stones will not fragment nearly as well as calcium oxalate dihydrate stones in particular. A number of years ago, we put this nomogram together to try and again, help us predict what lithotripsy outcomes would be. This is a 48 year old urologist with a fairly large stone, but a favorable skin to stone distance and Hounsfield unit density. And what our model predicts is a single treatment success rate of about 87%. Now, if we change this up a little bit to a 28 year old, slightly out of shape because he works so hard resident so that he has the same stone, but a greater skin to stone distance, what we see is that the single treatment success rate drops dramatically to below 50%. So this is not to say that it's necessarily wrong to treat that urology resident with shockwave lithotripsy, it's just to say that when we're counseling him in advance, we need to be honest with him and tell him that results are going to be less favorable than they would be otherwise. So now we've decided to do shockwave lithotripsy. How are we going to optimize our technique? And I'm going to take you through each of these steps quickly just to show you how we can do that. So the first thing we need to do when we put the patient on the machine is to ensure that we couple properly. And we know that air or gas in the interface between the shockwave lithotripsy head and the patient will diffuse the energy extremely efficiently, and that's a bad thing. Bubbles that account for only 2% of the surface area of that contact surface area will lead to a 40% decrease in fragmentation and a very significant decrease in energy transmission. And so it's key that we make this interface as bubble-free as possible. You can do that by visual inspection. Some investigators use cameras to look at it, but this is a key and often overlooked principle. The second is that once we treat, we wanna make sure that the patient is adequately uh, sedated or analgesicized. This is a paper that demonstrated that patients treated under uh, general anesthetic did better than those under IV sedation. Now I'm not suggesting we need to treat all lithotripsy patients under general anesthesia, but this drives the point home that it's important that those patients be adequately sedated, have adequate analgesia, because if they don't, they'll move, they'll lift off the shock head, they'll break their coupling, they'll introduce air into the interface, and you won't be effectively targeting their stone. Now we can predict who has more pain during lithotripsy. This is a paper that identified that females had more pain, that patients with a history of anxiety or depression had more pain. If you previously had shockwave lithotripsy, if you were young, those are all risk factors. And if you had to treat through a rib, 
those patients all had more pain. And if you know this, you can plan in advance and make sure they have adequate sedation on board. We also know that the urologist matters. This was a study from our center a number of years ago where we compared the results of all 12 of our treating urologists and found that even in this group who did a lot of lithotripsy, there were differences among the operators and the best results. Now, just a caveat, this is before my time, so the best result was not me, but the best result was by the surgeon who treated the greatest number of patients, who also used the highest number of shocks per patient, and who had the longest fluoro time. And I think that's an important point in this day where we try to minimize fluoro exposure, that if you're using fluoroscopy for shockwave targeting, you need to use fluoroscopy. You need to use it significantly to ensure that you're always on the stone when you're doing your treatment. We also found that the lithotech matters too. This was a comparison of our lithotechs uh, after they've been in practice, if you will, for a year versus three years. And you can see that again, these techs do a lot of treatments at our place, but even after three years, the results got better. So technique does matter for shockwave lithotripsy as it does for all of the procedures we do. Treatment rate is another modifiable factor that we now know has a profound impact on results. Uh, the first generation lithotripters like the Dornier HM3 treated synchronized to the ECG rhythm. And so generally that meant treating at 60 to 80 shocks per minute. The second and third generation lithotripters then use ECG simulators or fixed treatment rates and often just ramped up treatment to 120 shocks per minute, which meant you could shorten your treatment time and treat more patients per day, but likely had an unintended consequence. And that was, we later learned that the second and third generation machines were worse than the first generation machines. Part of this may be due to design differences and differences in the size of the focal zone and the peak pressure generated, but likely part of those differences had to do with rate. And this was uh, our initial randomized trial that did indeed show that if you slow treatment rate from 120 shots per minute to 60, that for renal calculi, your results are better for all renal stones, but particularly for larger kidney stones. We then repeated this randomized trial in ureteral calculi and found exactly the same results, that again, whether it's two weeks or three months afterwards, treatment results are superior at the slower treatment rate. Another modifiable factor on the lithotriptor is how rapidly you increase your voltage during treatment. The standard thinking was that, well, you should get right up to the maximum voltage and energy as soon as possible and as fast as the patient can tolerate it, the thinking being that that way you maximize the energy that the stone sees during the treatment. The question is, is this optimal and there are, are there other ways to do it? We now know that in fact there are better ways to do it. This is data from uh, porcine experiments, but it holds true in humans as well, where if you prime the kidney with a relatively small number of low energy shocks, you can minimize renal injury. And this likely works by causing vasoconstriction within the kidney and you get far less intrarenal hemorrhage when you prime the kidney than when you don't prime the kidney. This is a clinical study that shows a similar benefit if you do a three minute pause between your priming shocks, your low energy shocks, and your final delivery of high energy shocks. Once again, you have reduced renal injury if you do that. And so these are important measures to take, not so much for improving fragmentation, but for reducing renal injury. Now this study is a randomized trial that we did, which was a gigantic blunder. Um, I say that because we thought, okay, well, you know what, maybe we should try and test a more gradual voltage escalation, 1,000 shocks at 15, 1,000 at 19, and 1,000 at 23 versus a small number at low energy and then the rest of the shocks, all of them at higher energy. And in fact, this was a mistake because these patients in the gradual group were basically just undertreated. They had inferior treatment results but no difference in renal injury, no difference in perinephric hematomas, so don't do this. Instead, prime with a couple of hundred of low energy shocks, perhaps pause, and then treat with the balance of your treatment at high energy. On uh, machines like the Stortz SLX F2 lithotriptor, you can also modify the size of the focal zone. They call it narrow and wide. I call it really, it should be shallow and deep. This is the smaller focal zone. This is the larger focal zone. You can theoretically argue in favor of either one of them. The narrow focal zone achieves a higher energy density, and so one would say, well, maybe that makes break stones better. The larger focal zone allows the stone to spend more time in the focal zone, particularly with respiratory excursion, so you could argue, well, maybe that one works better. 
And whenever you're unsure what you should you do, well, you should do a randomized trial. And so that's what we did. We did a randomized trial comparing narrow versus wide. We found that narrow is better. It breaks the stones better. And when you look at complications, hematoma, and markers of renal injury, you don't see any difference. These, these lines are interchangeable. And so uh, there's no less renal injury, but there's better fragmentation with, sorry, there's no more renal injury, and there's better fragmentation with the narrow focal zone. So you finish your treatment. What can you do when the patient walks out the door? And the answer is, well, there's actually a fair bit you can do. One of the problems, of course, with shockwave lithotripsy are residual fragments in the lower pole afterwards, sand and small fragments, particularly when you're treating lower calocele stones. This is a very old study. If you zoom in, you can see that that's me wearing pleated pants, just to give you an idea of how out of fashion it is. But what this showed is that a combination of postural inversion, mechanical percussion, this is a mechanical chest percussor that the physiotherapists use for cystic fibrosis patients, and diuresis can lead in this uh, single crossover randomized trial, about 60% of patients to be rendered stone free who were residual sand and small fragments in the lower pole after shockwave lithotripsy. A Turkish group demonstrated that potassium citrate was helpful. They randomized calcium oxalate stones after shockwave lithotripsy to receive potassium citrate or not. And I don't understand exactly the mechanism here, but they found that those given potassium citrate uh, had fewer residual fragments than those for, who were not. Um, so that's just food for thought. Medical expulsive therapy also lends itself beautifully to shockwave lithotripsy. There were two seminal randomized trials that suggested a benefit. Uh, we did a meta-analysis, which confirmed that there was a benefit, particularly for stones greater than a centimeter. This increased stone-free rates and reduced residual fragment rates. So one of the things we often don't talk about a lot are patients and what they think about their treatments and what treatments they should undergo. And this, I think, raises the key uh, question and key point about informed decision-making. Because if you ask patients, for example, like Kuo did, who had patients who had had both a PCNL and a shockwave lithotripsy treatment, what they would rather have if they got another stone, they all said they'd have shockwave lithotripsy over a perk. Similarly, Carlson did the same with shockwave lithotripsy and ureteroscopy. And while overall satisfaction rates were high for both, they were higher for lithotripsy. And once again, the litho crowd would rather have litho again rather than have ureteroscopy again. Why is this? Well, I think a lot of it has to do, well, of course, shockwave lithotripsy is totally non-invasive, but it also has to do with the stent or the tube because that is the enemy and patients really dislike them. We know from eight randomized trials that ureteric stents are not routinely needed prior to shockwave lithotripsy, and in fact, they may be harmful. They may increase emergency visits, they may decrease stone-free rates, and that's why the guidelines suggest that do not place a stent routinely prior to shockwave lithotripsy. At our center, where we do about 2,500 treatments a year, uh, only about 15% of our patients are treated with stents, and these have all been placed for imperative indications like unremitting colic or infection. In contrast, while we know that you can do ureteroscopy and PCNL in a tube or stent-free fashion, the reality is that if we look worldwide with Crohn's data, the vast majority of these patients have a stent for a period of time ranging from two days to two weeks or more. And so the reality is the vast majority of these patients have stents and the morbidity attendant upon stents. So what are my conclusions? Well, I think that shockwave lithotripsy is alive and well. Uh, it may not be the market leader anymore, anymore, but it certainly has its role to play, particularly with informed patient decision-making, patient selection, and if you don't pre-stent your patients routinely. One thing that I think, uh, one point I wanna make is that although we have information like Hounsfield unit and skin to stone distance and size, these are not in and of themselves exclusion criteria for shockwave lithotripsy. So just because a patient has a uh, Hounsfield unit density of 1001 rather than 999 does not mean that you should not perform shockwave lithotripsy on them. It does mean though that you need to use that information to predict for the patient what their expected results would be. And then when you do treatment, make sure you have excellent coupling with no bubbles. Make sure you have excellent IV sedation and analgesia so there's no patient movement or lifting. Make sure you have an experienced technologist and urologist because technique does matter. Make sure that you have precise targeting, which if you're using fluoro means you use your fluoro to stay on the stone. Make sure that you treat at a slower rate of 60, perhaps 90, as uh, some more recent studies suggest that uh, outcomes for patients treated at 90 are similar to 60, 
but the bottom line is don't treat routinely at 120 because slower is better. And if you have a choice, use the narrow focal zone because it's better with no more renal injury than the wide. And pause for the cause, that is prime the kidney with some low energy shocks, pause, and then deliver maximum energy thereafter. You wanna to go to the max to make sure that you deliver energy to that stone. And you wanna make sure you give a sufficient number of shocks. That means go to the max again. If your machine suggests treating up to 3000 for renal calculi, go up to 3000 unless the stone disappears on imaging. And after your treatment, consider medical expulsive therapy, consider postural inversion, and consider potassium citrate to improve your outcomes even more. Thank you again for the opportunity. Um, I know this meeting is on the wrong coast for you, but I'm the president of the Northeast section. I don't know if this meeting is gonna happen. I hope it does, and it may be one of our first opportunities to perhaps get together again in person. Uh, only time will tell. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken, um, for that very informative and um, useful talk. Um, our final speaker, our, our secretary, Use of ultrasound guidance for percutaneous nephrolithotripsy here in the United States, some of which he will be uh, sharing with the, with us today. Thank you, Dr. G. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, two wonderful talks, and, and also uh, thank you so much to Dr. Gill, Dr. Wynn, uh, and the whole USC team for putting together such a great uh, lecture series. You know, I think that the opportunity to do this type of virtual education uh, brings the whole world together. You know, so there, there's a silver lining here. Um, Ken and, and, and Roger, great talk as always. I, I'll start wearing those pleated pants again, for sure. So uh, today, I'll, you know, I'm gonna kind of shift gears a little bit. Uh, my talk, uh, rather than be an overview of multiple things, uh, we'll be zooming in really on that last bit that, uh, that Dr. Wynn had mentioned, the idea of, you know, how do we do ultrasound? Because I think that PCNL, really, you know, there's lots of data about PCNL, great for big stones. You know, there, there's indications for its use in surgical management but it's really about getting the perfect access. So if you can really get that access just right, it'll get everything better for you. And Dr. so- uh, you, Dr. Chi, could you go to full screen on your slides? Of course, that would probably help everybody, huh? So uh, thank Love. you for that. So my disclosures are here. Um, none of them are fairly relevant to this particular talk. Uh, the, my goal is to get you to kind of understand that ultrasound guidance for PCNL access, I think, is achievable. And, you know, whether you use fluoro or you use uh, endoscopic guidance or you use ultrasound guidance, the goal is just to get that right access. And uh, I'm obviously ultrasound biased, and you'll see that bias in this talk. Uh, but uh, just at least to talk about the concepts there. And then to give you the technical step-by-steps on how to get there and hopefully the impact of what it would look like if you were to use ultrasound in your own practice. So generally speaking, you know, this concept of ultrasound uh, for a long time has really been under talked about, I'd say. And uh, when we think about urologists getting access to the kidney, you know, people say, oh, nobody gets ultrasound really because we're, we're kind of a fluoro society. And when you looked in the literature 15 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, there's a couple places in the world where you're using ultrasound more, China, India, some parts of the Middle East and Europe. And so people have not really associated it with getting renal access for PCNL. But when you actually think about the number of people who are sticking needles into kidneys, most of them are being done by interventional urologists or interventional radiologists. And I would argue that we are not worse proceduralists than the interventional radiologist. We respect their work, but I don't think we're any worse than what, they, what we do than they are. And so when you actually think about people putting needles into kidneys, and if you've ever been down to an IR suite, they use ultrasound. So the real world looks like this, everybody using ultrasound. So I think from that perspective, maybe as a urology group, we've lost a little bit of sight of that. So I went away and learned from some folks that I'd met uh, in China. And when I came back, I just kind of copied what they'd done and you know, looked at their moves. And this is me after my sixth case. And uh, after about six cases, and essentially this is like learning surgery from a YouTube video, because I'm just watching their moves and trying to copy them. You can see with a single pass, I'm in the kidney. That's an unedited video. It's about 12 seconds. And that was the moment I thought, okay, well, maybe we have missed the boat a little bit. And let's try to understand this and, and use it more. 
And since then, in the last six or seven years or so, we really kind of zoomed in on, on how do we actually teach this in a way, and I think it can boil down to about two skills that can really change your practice. The first skill is about imaging. And what you're seeing here is me in the operating room, I'm holding the ultrasound probe with my right hand there, and somebody's injecting a little bit of saline to induce hydronephrosis in the kidney. And what you're seeing here on the uh, right side of the screen is a picture of the kidney, that's that oval shape. The dark gray is the meat. Uh, the light gray is the fat, the hyalur fat. The black space is the urinary space, and that very bright white thing that the white uh, arrow is pointing to is a stone. If you can get that picture, you can perform ultrasound guided access. And I think that what we're used to really is uh, seeing a retrograde polygram. So this is kind of a typical simple collecting system. And then when we're trying to get access, we always think about the posterior versus the anterior calyx in the prone position. And on a simple case, that might be fairly easy to figure out. But on a complex case that you see here, where you know, it looks like antlers on a, on a deer's head, it's very hard to figure that out. And with fluoroscopy, just to kind of give a general overview, I generally use a triangulation method. So I'll lay my needle right on top of the kidney. I'll find what I think is that posterior calyx. And then I stick my needle in. And then I'm rotating my C arm so that I can try to triangulate the depth and then I take another shot. And then I can see that my needle has now fallen away from where it ought to have been. And so I know my depth is off, so I gotta adjust. But it takes a lot of kind of mental exercise to put your needle in the right place. As opposed to ultrasound, this is that same picture that I just showed you before. And when you look at the picture here, uh, anything towards the top of the screen in that prone position is posterior by definition. So figuring out which calyx you got to go into is no longer a challenge. You just have to find what's closest to the top of the screen and what's easiest to get yourself into. So in this particular case, uh, anything at the top of the screen that is black covered by white, that's where you want to stick your needle into. How do we get there? So generally speaking, this is kind of a typical San Francisco patient that's uh, you know been working their, on their abs for a while. And uh, in the prone position, we mark out the same anatomy that we use for fluoroscopy. So you see the, the 12th, 11th, and 10th ribs. And then you've got the top of the iliac crest, the paraspinous muscle, and uh, we lay the probe right on top of that area, parallel to the paraspinous muscle. And when you do that, the beginner's uh, tendency is always to put it right in that soft spot, right in that Pettit's triangle. The kidney is always a little bit higher and a little bit more medial than you think. And so if you just think about that concept, find the kidney first as your parallel, just understand the anatomy and see what you're seeing. And then you rotate the probe and that's what you're seeing on the right side of the screen. So it's parallel to the ribs to get rid of any rib shadow. I'll show you this video here and I use saline in the operating room so I don't get my hands all sticky and gooey. And that's my, my uh, anatomy. This is a supine position case, but it's, it's the same concept. So you've got the iliac crest and the ribs marked out there. And I use an abdominal probe. You have a standard abdominal probe. That's a 3.5 to 5 megahertz probe. Everybody's got one in your operating room. They're the cheapest probe out there. And you just stick it on the body parallel to the spine. And then I'm just testing to make sure that the foot side of the body that I'm pushing on pushes the right side of the screen. In this case, it didn't. So I flip my probe around to stay oriented and then I'm finding the kidney, then I rotate my probe, so now that shadow at the top, that was the ribs, disappears. And now you can see on the left side of the, uh, the moving image, uh, the ultrasound image, the kidney's there in a nice longitudinal view, and I'm finding the parenchyma, the hyalur fat, and the collecting system now. So if you use that approach and you can get that view, you can do ultrasound access. The other nice thing about ultrasound is that there are things that you can see that are hard to see in fluoroscopy. What you're seeing here is that sliding white thing that's very sparkly coming in from the left side of the screen every time the patient breathes. That's called a pleural sliding sign. So if you see that, you don't want to stick a needle into it because you are in danger of a pneumothorax. And if you see sparkly moving things towards the right of the screen, well, that's large bowel. So that's colon right there next to the kidney. And if you see that, you don't want to stick a needle in there. And here's the liver and the spleen. So the liver is triangular. It's slightly hyperechoic compared to the kidney. And the uh, spleen is um, echogenic texture. It's similar to the kidney uh, compared to the spleen. And you know that all those things you read in a radiology textbook, I have no idea. I'm not a radiologist. And so when I see something big and triangular on top of the kidney, I just know, well, that looks bad. Let's not stick a needle into it. As opposed to under fluoroscopy, this is what the pleura, the bowel, the liver, and the spleen look like. 
They're virtually invisible. So clearly there are some advantages clinically to avoiding bad structures with ultrasound. I think that's a nice appeal of ultrasound as well. So I said that there are two skills for you to be able to achieve ultrasound guided access. That second skill is really controlling the needle. And so the key concept here is once you've got that imaging down, you really focus on getting the imaging, bringing the needle into the image is how you achieve that guidance. So what you're seeing here is me holding the probe now in my non-dominant hand, my left hand, and I'm bringing the needle in on the top of the probe, which means it comes in from the left side of the screen and you're seeing it pointed out in that white arrow. So the bright line coming in from the left side of the screen, that's the needle. And so you wanna see it as it comes into the screen so you can watch it enter the kidney. There's multiple ways to put the needle in place from the top of the probe, from the bottom of the probe, like in the middle part of the screen or from the side of the probe. I generally teach what I call the longitudinal needle insertion. So you're putting the needle in from the top of the probe or from the back of the probe or behind the probe. And the reason for that is you get a longitudinal shot of the kidney. You can see more anatomy in place. And then when you put the needle in from the top of the bottom of the probe, you see the entire length of the needle. And that way you feel much more confident that you're not going through things like the lung, the liver, the spleen, the bowel. And you can see the entire needle entry and have much more confidence in, in, your, in your access. The way that we teach that, we use a, a phantom for hands-on training. And there's two ways to find your needle. One is I'm holding the needle very still, and now I'm fanning my probe back and forth to find my target. That's that big white circle at the upper left of the screen. And when I find my target, then I find where my needle is. Then I go back to the target image, and I know that's the direction I wanna move my needle. So then I swing my needle into the target plane, and I advance my needle in that plane. So I'm leaving my needle still first, and then moving my imaging plane. The second way is I'm leaving my imaging hand very, very still to, on the target, and I'm bouncing that needle back and forth in and out of the imaging plane. And once I find the needle in the imaging plane, then I advance it forward in that imaging plane right into the target. So here, I'm moving my needle and keeping my image very still. But the key concept here is move one hand or the other, but not both because you'll get confused and get lost. And now that we've been doing this for a while, uh, you know, I, I was fluoroscopy trained. I did all my cases under fluoroscopy. And now that I've been doing ultrasound, I've switched virtually almost all my cases to ultrasound. And we've kind of got a, a good sense of kind of what the differences are and where some advantages and disadvantages are. Hopefully I've proved to you by now that that posterior calyx is easier to identify with ultrasound and that you can see things around the kidney using ultrasound compared to fluoroscopy. I'll show you some of the data that we've produced that shows that there's, you know, decreased expense and decreased radiation exposure. But I think the most compelling thing is that the learning curve is much shorter when you use ultrasound compared to fluoroscopy, which is why I've been much more uh, inclined to use ultrasound and teach ultrasound in recent years. People have published that when it comes to renal access with fluoro, it takes about 60 cases to achieve confidence and maybe as many as 120 to gain mastery. Compared to that, when I first came back and started doing ultrasound on my own, so this is like me, like I said, learning surgery from YouTube and just trying to figure out as I go, it took about 20 cases doing that to try to get to a place where I could actually get the needle in most times. And so, and you can tell the first part of the learning curve now wasn't very good at all, but despite that, I could get there at about 20 cases. Now, comparatively, you fast forward five years and I'm teaching the trainees and teaching folks who come to learn from us exactly the same way that I showed you now. And with the fourth year resident, after about five cases, they can actually get reasonable success. And so I think that shorter learning curve is very compelling because ultimately, if you want to do good PCNL, you've got to get great access. Some of the impacts this would have on your practice, we've shown that because ultrasound machines are uh, less expensive and you can share them amongst multiple services, they're more cost effective compared to fluoroscopy. Everybody's got an ultrasound machine around. You're probably using it for your robotic partials. You're probably using it for the thyroid surgeons, everybody else. So you can use that ultrasound machine and share that cost. The obvious uh, upshot is that you've got radiation exposure reduction. So this is a paper from when we first started doing it, my first 100 cases, uh, we just took our fluoro amount of radiation that we did pre-ultrasound, and that's that leftmost bar. And then when we first started using ultrasound, just by trying ultrasound, we cut our radiation exposure by half. And then as we got better and better at it, we reduced that ultrasound, uh, we reduced that radiation exposure until it was quite a lot less, about a fifth of what we were using before. And now that we've got a bunch more cases under our belt, uh, we've also been able to publish that you can do this entire procedure ultrasound guided and x-ray free. That's very achievable and you get the same clinical results compared to fluoroscopy. 
if you want to get to a point where you don't need to wear your heavy lead anymore and uh, you want to not use any type of x-ray at all, uh, not even the four minutes that Ken showed in the, on the shockwave machine, uh, the easiest pathway there is probably doing a combined approach. So if you used ultrasound, got your access and had a scope up the inside, uh, and this is a paper from Dwayne Baldwin out of the Loma Linda group, you can actually achieve uh, your dilation under direct vision and then you've got a complete x-ray free, uh, uh, radiation free PCNL. So that's a very nice uh, target to be able to get to. As you transition to ultrasound, here are some of my tips and tricks. The thing that people worry about initially is how do I control my needle? But I actually think the key to success is about how do I image better? We're not really used to imaging really uh, a lot of kidneys because we just don't train like that in the United States. So if you had just spent five minutes on every patient. So when I first started, I ultrasounded every kidney. So in the clinic, person comes in, I've got left-sided ball pain, I've got terrible prostatitis. I'd say, oh, I'm really worried about your kidneys. So let's just flip you over and uh, take a look at your kidneys. And the patient's very happy. And then I'd say, oh, you know, I, I like to do this prone, just, you know, I get a better image. And they don't know I'm just practicing, but I'm spending a couple minutes with them and getting my learning curve up. When you start out, start with easy cases. So it's not the time to go after that BMI of 60 with a staghorn stone and no hydronephrosis. Get a smaller stone with a dilated collecting system and have your backup ready. So if you're a person who uses fluoro or who partners with uh, one of your urology partners or an interventional radiology colleague to help you get access, just make sure that they're there to back you up if you wanna start transitioning over. I'm gonna skip past the tips and tricks area. Um, Actually, maybe I will show this video. So uh, as far as kind of helping yourself do better with ultrasound initially, here's a couple of things that I do that I focus in on. One of them is, you know, what do I use? There's a lot of knobs in your ultrasound machine. I really only touch two, essentially. The first one is depth. So I make my picture big enough to magnify my kidney to show me all the detail that I want. And that way, I just want it to be big enough so it's filling up the screen, but not so big that it's actually being cut off. So that's number one. Number two, I just adjust the brightness. So there's a knob that usually changes the gain. And plus you've got these depth adjustments uh, of, of gain. So you can change the picture so that you can see it better on your screen. And you just want it to be bright enough so it's obvious to you and easy to see. Like I said before, don't start with the biggest people. If you look at the learning curve and you're looking at BMI above 30 and above 40, it shifts your learning curve over quite a bit. So start with the skinnier patients when you're starting out. And one of the things that, that to keep in mind is that you can always use a, a probe, a needle guide. So everybody makes a needle guide that goes on just like a truss probe guide, but this is for kidney uh, biopsies. So if you leave that probe guide on there, you can just focus on the imaging and then use the guide to push your needle into place. So in conclusion, hopefully I've uh, convinced you all here that ultrasound I think is achievable by anybody on the Zoom call. Uh, there's been a lot of gain, uh, gaining of acceptance worldwide. So, you know, 10, 15 years ago, there was about uh, six or seven papers on the concept. And now you fast forward and there's almost 100 papers published on this topic. And so we've kind of shifted people's practice around the world. I think it's a very viable, teachable option for folks. And, uh, you know, we're at a place where we teach everybody access and our trainees, they would leave and only about one out of five or so would actually use this in their practice at any time in their careers. And now that we're graduating residents using uh, ultrasound, it's about two uh, out of every three. So I think that it has made a difference in terms of people being comfortable. A lot of this work's been a big team and we've been very appreciative of that and some NIH funding over the years. And my last slide here is, uh, you know, we were fortunate to get a, a great course that was gonna teach you all these things in a hands-on format at the National AUA conference uh, this year. Obviously, the, the uh, meeting got canceled, but it will be held next year. So uh, look for a registration eventually. Rob Sweet does a terrific course, and the AOA sponsors some other hands-on courses. Feel free to please reach out to me at any time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you again so much for having me and for your attention. Thank you, Tom, for that very informative and compelling talk. I, I do think ultrasound is something that is the future and a lot of uh, something I've been trying to teach our residents here as well. Um, in the time we have left, uh, I'd like to briefly ask our panelists their opinions and their approach to uh, some common stone scenarios. So in the interest of time, I'll, I'm going to have um, just uh, some panelists discuss some cases and some panelists discuss other cases. So for the first scenario is the, um, the lower pole stone. Um, you know, how do you approach a lower pole stone in your practice? I've uh, set up three different types of cases with a little bit of variation in anatomy. In the first case, you have a eight millimeter stone, 800 Hounsfield unit, normal BMI, normal anatomy. 
In the second situation, you have the same thing, except you have a long infundibulum. And in the third situation, you have a larger stone, 1.2 centimeters. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Sir. Uh, Dr. Sir, how, how would you approach these? What would be your recommendation for each of these cases and what factors do you think would be important to consider? Yeah. So I think for the first case on the far left, that's the easier of the three cases there. Um, could you put that back up, actually that picture? Thanks. Um, I would offer the patient uh, both options of shockwave or ureteroscopy. And uh, I think the, um, the guidelines definitely support shockwave and ureteroscopy is an option as well. Um, and I just tell them this, I say for shockwave, I don't quote them numbers. Um, I just say, look, it's less invasive, but it's potentially less effective. Whereas ureteroscopy, it's more invasive, but it's, uh, it's more effective, but more invasive. So there's a trade-off there, and it's a shared decision that the patient needs to be involved with. And at the end of the day, whatever they want to do, as long as they understand that there are you know, advantages and disadvantages to either one of those. Um, the second case here, long infundibulum, now I, I think we're suggesting that this is like an unfavorable um, lower pole because of the infundibular uh, length. Um, and so I might sway them a little bit towards shock uh, ureteroscopy in this case. But again, I think shockwave is, is not unreasonable. Uh, it's not a, an obese patient. The skin stone distance is not bad. It's not a terribly dense stone. So I'm willing to do shockwave again with a caveat. It's just, just going to be less effective. Um, but I would probably, if they ask me, I'll push them towards ureteroscopy. And the last one, um, this is where maybe my practice might differ from many, uh, many people. Um, I have a preference for a percutaneous approach uh, for the following situations. If the stone is in the lower pole and is greater than a centimeter, um, or it's a hard stone, um, those are situations that I think uh, those are two situations I feel like might favor a percutaneous approach, um, particularly because there are now many PCNL uh, devices that we have, and the data suggests that the mini PCNL morbidity is not terribly worse than ureteroscopy, but the outcomes, the stone free rates, are better than ureteroscopy. There are two meta analyses that suggest this. And in fact, in our own experience, our patients go home more often than not the same day, like not. 23 hours later, but usually one or two hours after surgery from a mini PCNL, they'll go home the same day uh, with an indwelling ureteral stent. So in that sense, I feel like I'm achieving better stone free rates and yet the same morbidity associated with ureteroscopy. So it's a win-win in my mind for a mini PCNL. Roger, do you find that um, patients are amenable to that or do you find that they're resistant when you recommend a PCNL? You know, um, I, I think at the end of the day, we probably all have experienced this, that patients are looking to us for their, for our advice. They, it's kind of like when we go to a car mechanic, you know, when we go to a car mechanic, if the car mechanic says, you need the transmission change, we're like, okay, I guess if we need to transmit, I don't want to pay for it, but if you say so, what do I know? And I think it's the same scenario. They come to us and it's like, what do they know? This may be their first stone, or even if it's not their first stone, they don't have the, you know, the, uh, the insight that you and I have. And so in many ways, I feel like they are relying on, on our opinion and where we think they should go. But at the end of the day, it is a shared decision. So if they're not comfortable with that, then I'm okay doing what they want to do uh, as long as I perceive it to be a reasonable option. Okay. Thank you, Roger. Um, so let's move on. I'm going to ask Ken to comment on these cases. Ken, would you do shockwave on all three of these cases or what's your approach? So uh, I know you want me to say that they should all have shockwave lithotripsy. I'll, I'll say that if that's what you want. Uh, so I don't think it'd be wrong to do shockwave lithotripsy in any of these patients. I agree. This is all about informed decision making, presenting the patients with the options, the pros and the cons, and trying to help them make a decision. It's kind of like localized prostate cancer, but Oftentimes patients don't want to have input and they will take your direction and that that's fine. I think obviously the case on the left is a slam dunk for shockwave lithotripsy. 
The only point I make about the middle case is that we often don't know if the patient has a long infundibulum, especially with a non-contrast CT. We may not appreciate that from the uh, CT. I'm not sure that I would always key in on that. Certainly in the old days of IVPs, we knew that in advance, but today we're less likely. And certainly if the patient only had an ultrasound, you'd have no way of knowing about that long infundibulum. Uh, in that situation, I think shockwave lithotripsy with postural inversion really would work very well, assuming that the infundibulum was not narrow or you're not treating a caloceal diverticulum or something like that. And then for the case on the right, the um, AUA guidelines, sadly, of which I was a member, state that you're not supposed to offer that patient shockwave lithotripsy. I think that's wrong. I think there's no reason that you can't offer shockwave lithotripsy to a patient with a greater than one centimeter lower pole stone, as long as you disclose to them that there is a higher chance they may have residual fragments than with competing treatments, or there's a higher chance they may need two shockwave lithotripsy treatments to adequately fragment the stone, as opposed to perhaps one ureteroscopy and one PCNL. Uh, and the other thing is that for these cases, when you're approaching the ureteroscopically, just to remind everybody that ideally you would relocate those stones into the upper pole and treat them there, again, to try to reduce the risk of residual fragments in the lower pole. And you want to be diligent either about your dusting or about your fragment extraction if you're approaching it ureteroscopically, because we know that we're not as good as we think we are, and you need to spend that extra time to ensure a good result. Um, uh, I, I, I know the literature about mini PCNL. I'm not a huge fan of mini PCNL. What makes my mouth water at the idea of a stone that's about a centimeter in size is to do a perk and remove the stone intact. And so if it's a 26 French sheath, you can pull out a one centimeter stone through that intact, and then you know the patient is stone free. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. There's no worries about fragments or dust or anything. So um, that would be my argument for the dinosaur-like approach of a 26 French uh, PCNL. Thank you, Ken. I see that um, Dr. Fuchs has joined us. Gerhard, do you have any thoughts on these cases? Uh, well, actually I uh, do agree. First off, you know, it was an excellent session. Uh, unfortunately, I was stuck in the clinic and could only, you know, hear with one uh, ear, but uh, it was excellent. You know, you guys did a great job. Uh, as far as these three cases go, uh, I'm actually with Roger. You know, uh, <clears throat> the only reason why I'm not quiet with him is because we don't have an ESWL machine uh, <laughs> routinely. So uh, basically, uh, you know, the uh, eight millimeter with normal anatomy, uh, favorable uh, for ESWL, but uh, since we don't have the machine, uh, that would be a retrograde intranal surgery. Likewise, the one with the long infundibulum and the one with the larger stone burden, I would discuss with the patient either retrograde uh, or the percutaneous approach. Okay. Thank you. Um, why don't we move on? Uh, Tom, I'm going to ask you to comment on the last, the second discussion. Um, here we have the situation of a renal pelvis stone. Um, and here I varied the, the stone size a little bit, 1.8 centimeters for the first two situations and 2.2 for the last situation. And um, the Hounsfield unit, the density is a little bit different here, uh, 700, 1,000 or 800 in these cases. So what, what is your approach and what are your thoughts um, in, these, in this scenario? So I'll give kind of a couple of general comments and then a, and then a couple of drilling comments. So the, I think that, you know, the BMI uh, and the uh, Hounsfield units are probably two factors that oftentimes we don't think about enough when it comes to choosing the, the right uh, procedure, the most effective procedure. And, you know, shockwave, uh, clearly, you know, harder stones, not so good, larger BMI, not so good. So those are factors to definitely consider when you're, when you're thinking about that. Uh, one thing along the shockwave lines, and I, I love Ken's talk, you know, uh, but one thing that, that I sometimes think that we also underestimate is the risk of Steinstrass over the larger size stone. So, uh, not to say that that makes it a bad choice for any one of these, maybe not the the middle one, uh, but you know, just as long as the patient understands that that that's a risk that could happen. Um, so that that'd be my general comment about like shockwave as an as an option for any of these. 
uh, the, the drilling comments I'd say is that, you know, for these, in my mind, they're, they're just about equivalent, 1.8 versus 2.2 centimeter stones. And, you know, that, that kind of like right in the middle of the kidney to me is that, that like, gosh, could you ask for a better chance to do like a really easy PCNL, you know? Uh, it does rely on you being able to have good access, obviously. Um, but I think that there's a couple of developments that kind of make this an interesting scenario that are, that are new in the last couple of years. Uh, one is that there's new technology to support miniaturized PCNL. So, you know, for a long time, there's just essentially one metal sheath system. Now there's a system called the clear Petra sheath, which is disposable that allows you to go in and has a suction on it. It's a much more user-friendly, nice way to get down to like 16 French or smaller. It does require to have smaller scopes, but if you stuck a, if you stuck something with a suction in there and then broke that stone down and sucked it out, I mean, it's a really easy way to get this patient home, maybe same day, like Roger's saying, very quickly with a minimal blood loss and minimal morbidity. Uh, and then, you know, Roger's point about the new uh, new energies on lasers, I think is a big deal. So uh, if you've got a high power laser, whether it's a Moses laser, or if you get your hands on a thulium laser, that may be a game changer in your practice, you know, because suddenly you can get to a bigger stone, more effective, less moving around on the stone, less retropulsion, maybe more effective stone free rates. And so uh, that, that to me is like a stay tuned, let's see how the thulium laser operates in each of those things. But I, I think that there's some new technology on the forefront now that also lets us kind of expand the way that we approach these types of stones right in the middle, right in the middle size there. I guess my thought is, you know, Ken's uh, graph where he showed PCNL is just staying static at the bottom there is, is what I've noticed is that a lot of folks in the community are moving more towards ureteroscopy even for very large stones. And with these new energy devices, it's like, how do we, is, is doing PCNLs in academia and in, in tertiary centers always going to just stay in academia and tertiary centers? And is ureteroscopy going to be what's going to happen out in the community? And how, how can we change that to make sure these stones are treated appropriately? I don't know, Roger, Ken, or Tom, do you guys have any thoughts? I just want to make a comment. I, I think it goes to um, my second point about stone-free rates. I think we need to be a lot more, as urologists, just really critical of what is the outcome we're trying to achieve. Are we trying to break up the stone and pull out a couple of pieces and leave some pieces behind? Or are we trying to really render the patient stone free? Because if you believe the UT Southwestern data, as well as the EDGE data, about a third to a half of these patients will go on to have another event. And again, if we personalize this, um, not that that's the way literature is, you know, represented, but if, if it's us, like, is that okay? Is that okay to have a procedure knowing that you're going to need another procedure down the road? I mean, that's not how we sell it, right? So if that's not how we sell it, then let's call, it, call a spade a spade. Let's call for what it really is. And then let's, if that's the case, let's offer the patient, at least offer the patient what we believe to be, uh, to give the best outcome. And I do think that, you know, things like ultrasound access and uteroscopic guidance access and teaching our trainees that so that they're not scared of doing PCNL when they go out and practice is really going to be key in terms of improving, improving stone free race in the future for these larger stones. So, Can um, I have one, one quick point just in this case, when you're talking about these intermediate sized stones, I think it's really critical that we look at the three dimensions of the stone because an 18 by 10 by 10 stone is very different than an 18 by 18 by 18 stone. The volume is greater. And so the likelihood then that you, you would benefit from a percutaneous approach as opposed to the others really goes up. So looking at the volume, not just the unidimensional um, measure, I'm not criticizing you for the case, but you know, especially like these oval stones, right? They often are a little bit smaller, they punch smaller than they are, and maybe you're better off you ureteroscopically but the rounder, three-dimensionally big stones, those are the ones really that are like a, I call these a slam dunk for a PCNL, right? That large renal pelvic stone is what we, it's what I dream about at night um, to get that done. You know, so I, again, I'm a dinosaur. I do 26 French uh, per, but uh, that's a one hour case. They go home the same day and that's with, and with a stent. So, um, stent on a tether, by the way. So. You know, you can do same day surgery perks, even with maxi perk. It doesn't just have to be mini perk. And, and I agree with Ken, you know, our initial series that we wrote up was all 30 French actually. So to your point, Ken, I mean, as much as I'm touting the mini PCNL, our original paper on outpatient was all 30 French going home one to two hours after surgery. So it may not need a 17 French or less than 24 French perk to go home. 
Okay, I think we're a little bit, 10 minutes past the time. So um, thank you everyone for joining. We really appreciate you um, donating your time and expertise. Dr. Gill, do you have any final comments? Yes, uh, <clears throat> I was hoping that uh, Mike, you'd have a case with a 3.8 centimeter kidney tumor and a <laughs> 1.2 centimeter renal stone, and that would get everybody going. <laughs> uh, because otherwise, you know, I really have nothing to add. But uh, uh, I just want to say thank you. That was absolutely a stellar conference. Um, I've been getting texts throughout your uh, speaking about uh, the, what, what a high quality presentation that all three of you have put together. And of course, Mike, uh, you, you've moderated it just beautifully um, with my good friend Gerhard always weighing in uh, and making sure everything is kosher. Um, this conference is gonna be live on the Urology uh, 60 Minutes, um, um, I think it's Facebook or something like that. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have over a thousand uh, folks who are now subscribers to this. So this will be visible there and available to everybody. But I just want to once again, just thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on this. Thank you, Mike, for an excellent job. And thank you, Gerhard, always. So just a round of applause for all of you. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night. Take care. Thanks. Good night. Bye -bye. Thanks, Dr. Gill. Take care, Mike. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, guys. Very good.